Awesome. You've all clapped already. Thank you. That means so much to me because you haven't even heard me speak. Now, I've started a new job. I started a new job with an American startup, so I've got a whole new vocabulary to learn <laughs> as a result of this, like runway and words like this and stuff. It's really weird. But one side effect of this is that I'm now a vice president, which sounds really important. But it turns out I still have a boss. <laughs> and I'm congrat contractually obliged to tell you that my boss is speaking upstairs at the moment. <laughs> so really, you should be in that room so that he feels better. Um, however, what he's actually talking about is AWS and how our production system works. So really, I should be up in that room to find out what actually is going on. But I'm Dot, I'm here, and we're going to be talking about Open API and how to improve your API. And by API, I'm talking about HTTP APIs. That's our surface area today. Mainly because I think APIs are really, really important. They power the internet today. There's nothing you do on your phone and an app that is not using an API. And phones are the main communications device for internet nowadays. So APIs literally are everywhere. And they're so bad. They really are. That's my job, is integrating with APIs. And my new job is actually making an API, and we're hoping to do it better than the stuff I've had to integrate against. So I spend quite a lot of time trying to teach people and rant at people about the things that they should get right about APIs. And today, we're going to talk about API descriptions, because they are how you can power your API and how you can make your API work that much better, that much easier, and be more likely to be something that I'm prepared to integrate with, which is a really key metric. We're going to be talking about Open API, Open API spec. This is the definition of Open API spec. The Open API specification defines a standard programming language agnostic interface description for HTTP APIs, which allows both humans and computers to discover and understand the capabilities of a service. This is possibly the most long-winded way to say anything, so you can tell it's a standard. Because this is what they do in standards. They write stuff like this and hope you understand what it means. The only really important bits in this entire thing is the word open. This is an open standard. It is not controlled by one company. That is extremely important if you want to get adoption on something, unless you're Facebook. For the rest of us, open makes a lot of sense. And the other really important thing in here is allows both humans and computers. So what we've got going on there is that both the humans are going to read this specification and also the computers can use and read and interpret this specification. Which means that we can write it once and use it twice. And we are developers. We love this as an idea. We don't necessarily practice it, but we do love the idea. So open API spec. API specifications are all about documentation. This is where we start. Um, you can document all kinds of APIs. Web hooks, normal endpoints, your web parameters, they will all need documenting. Open API spec is a really good way to do that. Having documentation is vital. It's really, really hard to work with an API that is not well documented because you think you know how it works by reading the output of the API as you play with it. And then you put it into production and discover the limitations of things you did not see. Documentation solves an awful lot of problems. The detail matters. Building specifications also means it's about design first. You can build your specification for an API you already have. So if you've got an API, you can write your specification for it. Please do that. That is really, really helpful. But what you can also do is you can design your API before you write your code. And that's even more powerful. 
One of the things that's happened at Covey since I joined, which has made my life considerably more complicated because I've only been there a month, is that we decided to rewrite the API payloads because that's what you do in startups. You move fast and break things even more. And to be fair, it was needed. The problem was that our original API payloads were very much designed when we didn't really know what the company was doing. I did mention startup, didn't I? So now we know more about what we're doing. So we're going to design the payload to fit the actual business domain that we're operating in. So it will be more coherent. That's a really good thing. And our product people cared a lot about hitting the business, name correctly, uh, business domain correctly. So we started with OpenAPI spec. Our CEO created the spec document. And we contributed to the spec and designed the payload with the correct terminology, including all the correct uh, validation requirements, before we touched the code base. You can't do that if you just write the code. I'm not letting my CTO anywhere near my code. I'm not letting my CEO, I'm not letting my CTO get them out of the production stuff. But yes, I don't want product in my code base. I want product at my design level. And I can do that with OpenAPI spec. We can do design first, and it's worked really, really well for this crash project that we did over the last fortnight. The spec is about communicating changes. Communication comes in two forms. We need to tell the people integrating. So people who are integrating with our specification need to know what's going on. We can do that. We also need to handle the fact we're going to change our spec. If you believe you're writing an API once and never going to change it, then I've got a bridge. APIs change. API spec like open API, open API is a text format. You know what's nice about text formats? You can diff them. And you can put them in your version control, which are two really, really helpful features that maybe your software as a service system doesn't have. Big, big feature advantage. And finally, I say nearly finally, it's about development workflows. What I mean here is that we can utilize the computer's ability to read our spec to make it help us implement that spec. And I quite like that, because I don't like doing boring work. And an awful lot of work around validating particular properties and stuff like that is not particularly interesting. And I can get the computer to do it because my spec is machine readable. And that is really powerful. So we're standardizing. It's a contract. I am creating a contract between me as the people developing the product, my product people who are trying to sell this thing, and my integrators who are implementing against my API. I've got a contract that we all agree this is how it's going to work. And over time, that is extremely helpful. We all know what's going on, and with any luck, we can know how to make sure it all works correctly for everyone. This is a really popular standard. Even the UK government uses it. This is one of the better things the UK government has done over the last few years. <laughs> what can I say? Um, but in, certainly in terms of tech and the way GovUK has gone, this has been an awesome piece of government. And when they were looking at which API specification to implement and whether they should have an API specification, they came up with this comment, one of the lead um, people on the team trying to decide this. And they said, using a consistent API description helps increase adoption of APIs across government. They were looking for the consistency that doing the specs first enabled them to get. And I saw another quote a little bit later where they saw they had seen that happen. So they could actually had this idea at the beginning, they looked later, and they had seen it happen, that they had increased adoption because they had consistency due to specking first. So that's all about why I like open API. That's why I like API specifications, why I think they're important. Let's talk about what it looks like. So if you've already written an API spec, you'll probably know all this already, because I'm about to delve into YAML. Awful lot of YAML. 
Now, the open API spec can be written in YAML or JSON. YAML is better than JSON. That's about as far as I'm prepared to go, really. Um, at least you could put comments in this version. <laughs> at the top level, we have a whole set of properties. The key one is the one at the number top, open API, which is which version of the spec format are we using for this document? Back to being computer readable. The computer needs to be able to understand this spec, so it needs to know which version of the spec this is. And this is version 3.1, which is the latest, but you might also have 3.0.3 because an awful lot of the tooling is still catching itself up to 3.1. This is a common theme with new versions of stuff. Uh, Derek talked about PHP 8.1 this morning, and I've got PHP 8.1 in my code base at work, and we have tooling problems that haven't quite caught up with PHP 8.1 yet. This is a thing that happens. So if you're one step back, that is perfectly fine if it makes your tooling easier. Just don't ever be two versions back. Then we get the metadata, things like info. So within info, we have title, version, description, contact information, stuff like that. For an internal thing, this is a little bit less important maybe, but contact is really, really helpful if you're going to be publishing this anywhere so that you know where to get help. I've put my contact name as Rob Allen on there, and I can also put my email address in and things like this. And this particular email, uh, sorry, API that I'm showing you is Rock, Paper, Scissors game. So it's clearly a hobby thing that I wrote. If you're doing it for your company, put a generic contact in there. Don't put your lead developer's contact, or definitely don't put your VP of engineering's contact in there. I don't want the emails directly. They want to go somewhere useful. But it does give people a point of contact, which is really important. You also list your servers, so where your staging server is, where your development server is, where the tests, where the actual production server is, they can all be documented as well, which again allows the tooling to find them and discover them. Then you get to the meet, the paths. The paths are all the operations that this API can do. So here we've got one called slash games, it's got get post, and we've got games, games ID, move, etc. It's quite a lot there. So look at one in particular. This is post to slash games. So what I'm going to do here is create a new game. Again, we have some metadata. I've got a summary, I've got a description. This is a slide, so my description is a grand total of about five or six words. In a real API description, you start seeing a paragraph there. You start seeing enough context that you can tell your integrators what they actually need to know in order to integrate against this API endpoint. You can obviously do that at the API level as well. Operation ID, it's a unique identifier for this particular operation, the concept of posting to slash games. Think carefully about how you define that because it turns up in some really weird places. One of the most common ones is it turns up as anchors and things like that in HTML documentation. So try to make it something that can actually be used as an anchor and still be grepped to be found back in the YAML because the publishers, the, sorry, the publishing software will change things if you do weird characters in there. Um, code generation tools will use it as a function name. So be aware of that as well when you're thinking about your name. It could turn up in your code base if someone has a smart idea. So maybe it's not so smart depending on your context. Then we've got our request body and our responses. If this was a get endpoint, we would probably have parameters and not a request body. Because get, uh, sorry, get uh, requests tend to have query parameters. When you post, you tend to use a request body. So uh, where did we get to? So I'm behind on my slides now. So here's our request body. Again, we have a description. This is a game to add. We have to define whether the request body is required or not, which I find really strange because it's very unusual to have a post request that doesn't need a body. I mean, it's possible, but it's not the normal use case. But the default is false on that, on that property. So if you want to say this request body must exist, then set the required to true. And don't walk into the lights. Then you've got your content. This is what's going in that body, and we define it per MIME type. 
because if you're writing a really long-lived API, then there's a really good chance you'll support more than JSON. If you're writing it for the enterprise, then you might support XML as well. And if you're writing for 10 years in the future, and your API is still going forwards, we might not be using JSON anymore. We might have come up with something else. So we define the MIME type. This is going to be the applications, uh, application JSON body here. I'm still behind. There we go. The key thing about sorry, let's go up there. The key thing about this request body is that I've got a reference, and the reference enables me to reuse some of my YAML in multiple places. And this is possibly the best feature of OpenAPI in my world, because I don't like typing things more than once. In the components section, I can define schemas. So here I've got a couple, I've got game ID, and then I've got player, because clearly I'm writing a game about rock, paper, scissors. I'm going to need a game, and I'm going to need players for my game. So clearly I'm going to have multiple uses of these concepts. So I define them once. And here's my player, it's a string, I've got an example of Lucy, etc. Go back to my game ID, here's my string, it's a format of UUID. That's interesting. I can be refined on my types. It's a string, but this particular string is UUID. So again, my computer can do more information about it. And I can define my example. And then I can reuse my game ID wherever I want to use it. And if I decide that my game ID should not be a UUID, I can change it once, and it will change across my entire spec. Don't do that after it's in production. <laughs> then I can build on that. I can put components on top of components. So go back to where we were with our new game request. My new game request, so I'm going to create a new game. I'm going to need a player, clearly. In fact, because I'm playing rock, paper, scissors, I'm going to need two players. It's really hard to play rock, paper, scissors on your own. So we're going to need two. So I define my two players, and I make them required. You don't have to make every property required, because it's really common that you have a payload for a post request where not every single property is required. So you have to specify each property in turn. And again, you define your example. I really like the fact that we have to define our examples. Because as we define our examples whilst we're writing our spec, we think about what they look like, which is quite a useful thought process. And they tell our integrators something useful. This is what we were thinking about. And people grok examples really quickly. It's much easier to read that example and see, oh yeah, player one, player two, than it is to actually read the YAML itself. Going back to our request body, that's where you put it, and we have a complete request. That's, we can now create our game. Responses work exactly the same way. We have a response, and then we have our status code. You can't send a response back down an HTTP connection without a status code. So define all of them. It doesn't confuse your integrator if you tell them all the possible status codes that come back. They like you if you do that. So my particular one here, I'm creating a new game, so I've got a 201 for creation, I've got a 400 for when you screw it up, and I've got a 500 for when I screw it up. Fundamentally, that's all you need. You can put some other ones in, but they're the key ones. And again, we go through to the components where we define them. I'm not going to show you because you've seen enough YAML on this bit anyway. There's a bit of an argument about whether you should bother putting a reference in for something that you're only going to use once. So new game response practically doesn't get used anywhere other than in this one response. So I could have just typed it straight into the slide, put it straight there, and I do see that in specs that I read. For something like internal server error, <laughs> let's face it, every single endpoint <laughs> could have an internal server error. So you may as well reuse that one. So there it's a stylistic thing. Do I always use components or do I mix and match? I don't have an answer. I don't mind which you do. I personally quite like using separate components because I find it easier to read the YAML and get an overview of what's going on with this particular set of responses when I don't have to wade through all the detail of one particular body. 
but other people, other teams have different opinions. Lots of yaml. Did you notice that? There were lots and lots of yaml. These files get really, really big. We can help you write it. At the end of the day, it is just text. So your first thing is, get an editor that supports plugins. Now, you're all developers, or adjacent to development. So you probably already have an editor that uses plugins, because we all do. So whether you're using Vim, whether you're using VS Code, Sublime Text, uh, one of the JetBrains IDEs, they all do plugins. And get the good plugins for YAML, and get the plugins for OpenAPI, and your life will be much easier. This example here is VS, VS Code, which is relatively new to me. I've just started using it. And it's got this feature where on the left-hand side, it will give you the breakdown of your um, YAML format, so you can easily jump between the different sections. Not uncommon. It's the same basic process that we have for jumping between functions in a PHP file, for instance. It's exactly the same section of code. So in PHP Storm, for instance, um, it's Command F12 on Mac to bring up the list of functions in your PHP file. If you open a YAML file, it will give you a list of top-level properties in the same window. So we, I quite like that. It means I can reuse the same muscle memory because I know Command 12 F very, very well. Folding is helpful if you're into folding. Again, you've got a really, really long YAML file. So if you can fold up your editor, that can help a bit as well. But editors. It's YAML, it's text, we have syntax highlighting. It's perfectly feasible to write your spec directly in plain text. As you can imagine, my CEO did not use plain text YAML to help us design our new payload bodies. I like my CEO quite a lot, but he's not really there with the deep down text stuff. And to be fair, that's not what he's paid for doing. So we used a GUI editor. This thing about this being an open standard means that there is a lot more tooling available because it's in a company's interest to support an open standard. Supporting a proprietary standard is much harder to, to get. You know, it's very difficult to justify building your business on a proprietary standard unless that proprietary standard happens to be really profitable. API specifications are not a particularly profitable area, <laughs> the grand scheme of things. So this is Stoplight. This is specifically Stoplight Studio. Stoplight is a company, Studio is a product, it is a desktop app, or it runs in a browser. There are other options out there, Open API GUI, Swagger Editor. They will do basically the same thing. You get a pretty GUI where you type things into a form and it turns into YAML for you. It's quite an easy way to edit and make changes as well, because you can dive straight into the right bit and make a change, particularly if you are a CEO. So we quite like this product, love this solution. And because it goes back to plain text, and Stoplight are a remarkably bright company, it also goes straight into my Git repository. So when my CEO does go and change my spec, I get a commit in my Git repository, so I know he did it. I love that feature too. <laughs> As you can well imagine, you, know, you let people loose and they go and do things. We can lint our spec. It is a standard, it is written down, therefore we can use tooling to find out if we got it right. CLI can do this, Spectral, OpenAPI Spec Validator are the two I've used, and we can put them into our continuous integration. So when my CEO goes and changes my spec, it goes into Git, and my Git will then check he didn't screw it up via this GitHub workflow. This is just normal stuff we do as developers. But we're now doing it to describe our API before we do it on our actual code base. Spectral, when you do um, a lint of the YAML file, you'll get this rather boring result of no results with severity of error or higher found. Personally, I would have preferred them to have said OK. Whatever. If you get it wrong, then you're going to tell you where it's wrong. It's a standard things like PHP CS or anything like that. You're going to get the row number, the column number, and what you did wrong. In this case, I commented out the contact section of the info um, block, and it got upset with me, as you'd expect it to. We've got the spec. 
We've written it. What are we going to do with it? Firstly, we're going to create some docs. Primary reason for writing a spec is that people are going to read it. And I know this will be a shock to you, but most people don't want to read YAML. <laughs> so let's put it in HTML. You can do it yourself. This is redoc. You use a command line tool, you point your um, YAML file against it, and it generates a pretty website for you. And we've got all our endpoints, we've got details about our endpoints, and then we've got examples over on the far right. And we've got a website. But we've got a website of spec. That's not the only documentation you're going to need. The spec is your reference documentation. It is the detail. It's all the detail about how the spec works. It is not the why, and it is not the how-to. So you're going to need tutorials. You're going to need other information in order to have a full set of documentation that a developer can use to integrate against your API. So this is the nucleus of it. The rest of it, we call a developer portal nowadays. In the old days, we called it a website. But we call it a developer portal now because it's maintained by people who understand developers, and we keep it separate from the stuff that is used for sales. And all the good API companies are using API spec in an open format and then put it into their developer portal. So here's one example, which is Plaid which is an American company that does banking in a way that we would not need to do in Europe because America has a unique set of banking systems. Plaid have done this. This is their website. It's got all their docs. You've got overviews. You've got libraries. You've got their API version. You've got the Postman collection. And you've got the reference material. And here, item slash get, retrieve an item, etc. And there's an example on the right you can spot where they probably started in their generation of this documentation, and it's come straight from GitHub. So the YAML file is in GitHub, or the JSON file, whichever they've used here. Um, I can't remember which one. And from that, they generated that portal, in the middle of it, and for the rest of it on the outside. And they're not the only people. Uh, one of the sponsors here, Vonage, does the same thing. There's their GitHub, and there is their developer portal. Exactly the same thing. You've got this spec. It is an open standard. It's not proprietary. Therefore, you publish it. If you're going to publish it, publish it in GitHub, and then you can have tooling that will generate your developer um, portal from that. Now we've got docs. What about us? What's the point of us having done all this right work writing this YAML as developers? Firstly, we can have a mock server. This is a really, really cool idea. It's really, really nice, this. A mock server will run your, read your uh, YAML file, and create a server that will behave as if you had written the code. So you can test whether this API makes sense before you write the API and you're committed to it. The reason it can do this is because you typed all those examples in earlier. And you typed in all the types of all the properties. So it can read the AML file. It is this is Prism, and it's correctly detected that there are four endpoints in my API. And it realized that I need have a dynamic parameter for my game ID. So it's put a UUID in there for me, because I told it the game ID was a UUID. That computer-readable bit of this spec is really, really cool. Prism, Lism, uh, sorry, Prism listens on 4010, so I can hit it with curl. That probably says something about me still using curl. You're probably all using Postman. It still works with Postman as well, but I use curl. I like curl. curl you should use curl. It's just wonderful. So I, I post to curl, and I post to, post, uh, to Prism, sorry, and I get the message back. Must provide both player one and player two because I've not provided player one and player two, and we defined them as required earlier. So Prism realizes that and has done validation for me. 
So I've not written any code yet. I'm now testing. Does this make sense? And behind the scenes, you can see what Prism did. It detected that we found the validation, and then it looked for a 422, because that would be the logical um, status code to send back. But I don't have a 422 defined, so Prism falls back to my 400, because that is what the spec requires you to do. It's a logical thing to do. And it sends back the correct error response as I defined for my server response in my spec. Mock servers are fantastic for determining the shape of your API. But once you've written all that source code, how do you know you've done it right? How do you know that that source code actually work, implements that spec that you claim it does? I'll give you a clue, it doesn't. You just think it does. People are really, really bad at validation. In the general sense. I don't mean you in particular, of course. Because we have this spec, because it is machine readable, we can use it in our source code itself to validate the incoming payload. So why don't we? Well, let's do so. We can put in CI as well. And the first thing you want to tell me is, you've already got validation. And I can tell you it's not good enough. And I know it's not good enough because I've dealt with so many code bases now that it is really not good enough. Two weeks ago, I was dealing with a validation error on a user password. Now, user password, that shouldn't be that difficult a thing to validate, you would think. It's got to be between this number of characters and that number of characters and have so many special things in it, whatever. Not a particularly difficult problem. You need to validate that password on, I think it was three different endpoints in the API. All three had different rules around that password. So you could create one that was four characters wrong, wrong but you couldn't change it because it needed to be at least, the old password needed to be at least five. And you can see how that happened. Someone changed the rule, edited where they thought the validation was in the code base, and didn't realize that that endpoint over there didn't use that same validation logic. Because whilst we like to think we reuse our code, quite often we don't. We just copy and paste it. And sometimes that is the right result, the right thing to do in development. But if you're trying to validate something that's an the same thing in multiple places, please use the same piece of source code for it. The other thing to be aware of is that if we validate off the spec, we are not validating everything. You still need to validate the business logic. My spec can tell me that the game ID is a UUID. It cannot tell me that that UID actually is a game in my database. So you need to actually do your business logic validation too anyway. That bit hasn't gone away. So how do we do PHP? We use uh, PHP League's OpenPSR 7 validator for API, OpenAPI 3, and we use OIS JSON schema for 3.1. Because one of the really cool things about OpenAPI 3.1 is that the response body and all the schemas are standard JSON schema. So we can use all the standard JSON schema validators nowadays. We don't need a special one. Your validation middleware, the algorithm is going to look something like this. We put it middleware, assuming you're using some sort of framework, you've probably got some sort of middleware. The reason we use middleware is because we can put it in one central place and it will affect all the endpoints we need it to much more simply. The logic's not that hard. We go receive the request and we go test is that request valid. If that request is valid, oh sorry, not valid, we go create a 422 and we go send it straight back to the browser. So I go completely bypass the rest of my application if you can't be bothered to send me the correct payload. Alternatively, I go run my application because you managed to send me the data I asked for. Thank you. Once I've, I've run my application, my application is going to send a payload back to you. And I tell you, you should validate that on the way out as well. Because this is a contract. We have told those people, this is what you're going to get back. So let's make sure we send back what we said we would. So is that response valid? If it isn't, we're going to send a 500 error. Now, that one, you're going to have a lot of trouble getting through product. 
product would far rather you send the broken response back again and create a ticket to be done on the backlog to fix it. My personal view is you create a 500 because that will make sure that it gets fixed far, far faster and send out that response. Otherwise, if the response is valid, obviously we're going to send the response back and it's all nice and smooth. Code is not very long either. It's about that long. But you people right at the back can't see it. So let's look at it with a bit bigger text. You can have a constructor because we believe in dependency injection nowadays. So what you need is a validator builder. Your validator builder will build you two validators. Sorry, put YAML file into it. And this line here is important. Passing YAML is not very fast. It's not the most tight spec in the world. So cache it. We don't need to re-pass that YAML file every single time. So we cache it. Now we've got a cache. We can just load our cache up, and off we go. And we generate our two validators, a request validator and a response validator. I apologize for the variable names, but I've only got so much width on my slide. And then we have our process where we're going to actually do the work. So that first diamond where you validate the request, we just call the validate method. One of the nice things about the PHP league is that they name their function sensibly. So we need to validate, we validate. If it succeeds, we carry on. If it doesn't succeed, we're going to get a validation failed exception, and we return that 422. Then we run our application. That's just standard, straight PHP, whatever you do in your framework. And we do the same thing again for our response. And again, we call validate. But this time, we pass in a match parameter. The batch parameter is to tell the validator which particular endpoint we're actually working through. And then we return our response on success. And again, we go through a 500 error otherwise. It doesn't take that long to build up a piece of middleware that fits your particular use case for your particular API to be doing this validation. That's a cool tool. Another cool tool is called Schema Thesis, which I have to be really careful about pronouncing because it's a horrible word. It really is. Schema Thesis. Um, I assume they thought it was a good idea for a product name. This tool will check that you've implemented what you said you would in your API. It's a compliance testing. It reads your API spec, and then it runs it against your runs a set of HTTP requests against your API to see if you respond the way you said you would. This is really scary the first time you run it. It really is. Um, it's Python tool, so we install it via pip, and we run it on the command line so we can put it into our CI, and you get a response that looks something like this. Obviously, I ran this after I'd fixed all the problems with my API spec which is why it says passed. <laughs> um, the interesting thing on this slide, though, is really small, and you can't see it, but somewhere down here, it says it did 306 tests per endpoint. This is a really, really small spec, and it found 306 variations of data to pass into my create game endpoint that it thought it needed to test. What is the chances you would have written 306 integration tests? Pretty slim. Pretty slim. This is why we have tooling. Tooling is wonderful. It does the work for us. Other interesting tools, Optic does BC break detection. This is another fantastic idea because it's an open spec and it's machine readable. You can commit a new version of your spec into the GitHub. You run Optic CI. And it will tell you, have you created an accidental BC break that all your integrators are going to moan about? Do you realize how many support tickets you have just saved yourself? How much documentation you could write if it's intentional before you actually release it to the world? BC breaks are horrible in APIs because communicating with your integrators is impossible. They only communicate with you once you've broken something. It's really, really difficult to get people to move API versions at the best of times. And breaking what they've got working is expensive for your integrators. Don't do it by accident. And 
Optic will help you not to do it by accident. PHP Open API Faker will generate you fake payloads that match your schema. So that's really quick to get some test data for you. Response to schema will go the other way, because you've got your API, and now you just want the schema. Response to schema will give you a schema for the API payload that it sees. You'll need to tweak it, but it at least gets you half the way there. Laravel Open API will generate your Open API spec from your Laravel app. Again, you'll need to tweak it, but it gives you a good head start if you've already got an API and want to move forward on it. And there's loads more. OpenAPI.tools has got loads and loads of tooling around this spec because it's open. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. OpenAPI spec is a fantastic way to document your API. I highly recommend you document your API. I think going into the nitty gritty, nitty ditty gritty, <laughs> nitty ditty, oh, for the sake, <laughs> <laughs> let's forget that one. Um, going into that level of detail is really, really important because it forces you to understand what your integrators need to understand because they have to understand all the edge cases because they have to code against it defensively, particularly if you haven't told them what's going to happen. So open API spec, it's about documentation, it's about design first, it's about communicating, it's about a contract. I think it's really, really helpful. Some resources, if you want to read the spec itself, it's on openapis.org, notice that that is plural. Openapi.tools for all the tooling. If you want to see a real live spec with an implementation, that rock, paper, scissors game is on GitHub at slim for RPS API on my GitHub, and the OpenAPI validator is obviously on GitHub too. I want to leave you with something that Phil Sturgeon said last week, which was extremely well timed for when I was creating this talk. <laughs> if you've not got a test suite, get a test suite. You really, really need a test suite. If you've not got OpenAPI, why are you making every step of the API lifecycle worse, slower, and more manual? And then there's some links. Either way, go open API. And I hopefully I've shown you why I think this is good and why Phil thinks this is good. Thank you. <laughs>